it is my pleasure to introduce an old friend. And by old friend, I simply mean that um, we've known each other for <laughs> I'm trying, Tom, I'm trying to think back. Was it like it's been 30 years, 25 years? Yeah. 1991, I think is. Oh uh, is my gosh. First got together. So that's math years ago. That, yeah, that's unbelievable. Um, yeah. Tom Parks, uh, an extremely successful audiobook narrator. Uh, and you've recorded how many audiobooks now? Man, but, you know, not that I, you're counting, I, I have- but. Yeah, I haven't updated the count like this year because I've been really super busy, but I think I'm up over 600 either recording or, or working as a director because I do both of those things. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's 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 a, it's enough that when people say, what did you record most recently? I often go... <laughs> let, me, let me look that I up on Audible. Remember. I need to go look at my calendar. <laughs> wow, only 600, huh? Yes. You must have a lot of spare time on your hands. I, Yes, so much time just laying around. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So since we since we last met, you were recorded, or not last met, but since we've last hung out together, you've recorded six hundred plus books. I know you're an audiophile earphones award winning narrator. Uh, you're also a finalist for the uh, the audio award, which is a really big deal. So I mean, um, yeah, congrats to your you. incredible success. And it's so funny because. I knew from just years ago, Tom and I had just messaged each other on Messenger, and I knew Tom was recording audiobooks. I honestly, Tom, I had no idea what you had done since then, but I'm just so excited for you, what you've done. And our paths crossed many years ago in a university setting where I was teaching. You were you were there as really as an adult student, not that undergrads aren't adults, but I, you know, you would come a little bit later. And um, you were helping out in the radio department because uh, the, the university owned a campus operation as well as an FM station. You were running, overseeing this this campus operation while I was uh, doing doing my job. And I, I my my greatest memory is me and you flying to New York oh to God. shop. Do you remember this? I do remember <laughs> this to 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 shop for um, uh, automated uh, software. Yeah. And, I, and I, what, I, what I remember, and I've told this story a couple of times, I remember that um, they were talking about redundancy of backing up the music because we were going to put all of the songs and everything on hard drives. Right. And I remember they were talking about one uh, gigabyte hard drives, one gigabyte. And we needed four of them. And they were like <laughs> $10,000 a piece. And you and I were both going, man, how can we ever afford $10,000 for, for a you know gigabyte hard drive? So, it, yeah. Little do we well, know, thirty years later, you could get a thumb drive, and it cost you a couple of bucks for it. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. And my greatest memory of that is was that we almost missed our plane coming back, <laughs> getting to Newark. Yes. That was uh, yes. anyhow. So whenever I think of you, I always think of the trip we made to New York to shop for automation software, awesome. <laughs> and awesome. how serendipitous that we would now be working in a in a in a uh, industry where we still require technology to allow us to do what we do. And before we get into the nitty gritty with Tom, I just want to say that Tom, uh, we've twisted his arm. He's he's agreed to teach what I'm going to call a masterclass in audiobook narration. I mean, it it can be nothing less than that from a guy who's done, you know, what you've accomplished. And we're going to put all the details in the uh, description of the uh, video so you can check that out. You can get signed up for that. But consider this, I I want to catch up with an old friend so you have a chance to kind of listen in and be a part of this and and we can learn more about, uh, about Tom's journey together. So, Tom, talk to me about you starting an audiobook. I mean, I remember that you were doing it, but I don't know how that, how did that all happen? So, what, what's weird is I did, um, back in the mid-80s, I was living in Lawrence, Kansas, and um, my wife at the time was attending the University of Kansas, and they had a um, an FM radio station that had what they called a subcarrier frequency and they had this uh, nonprofit called Audio Reader of Kansas. And it was a nonprofit audio listening service for the visually impaired. And basically, if you were visually impaired, you got this, this radio box, it's just this square box, and it had a single knob on it that was a volume knob. It didn't even have an on off switch on it. You either turned it up or you turned it down. And then what they did was they broadcast material for the visually impaired. And so every Friday night, I would go in at seven o'clock and I would read the Kansas City Star live and they would edit the newspaper and I would just read the articles to the visually impaired. 
Well, they also did audiobooks, and they, they were recording audiobooks on reel-to-reel -reel machines, no editing or anything. So all the mistakes and everything were there. And, and they had this old mobile home that they had converted into studio space. So you could hear everybody on either side recording and things like that. And so they said, you know, you did a good job with the newspapers. Do you want to try an audio book? And I said, sure, I'll go read an audio book. And so they had me go in. And it was terrible. I hated the experience. I, I thought, really? I, why would I ever want to do this again? <laughs> you know, the, the technology was clunky and the distractions and all those things. And so I don't think I even finished that first book. I think I got a day or so into it and went, yeah, this is not for me and never looked back. Well, then segue many years into the, into the future. And I was living in uh, Western Michigan and was actually pastoring a church. And one of my parishioners interviewed for a job with a company called Brilliance Audio, which is in Grand Haven, Michigan, and is owned by Amazon. And they're the second largest producer of audiobooks in the world. And my parishioner was interviewing to uh, be a receptionist. And in her interview, this frantic producer just happened to be walking down the hallway, stuck her head and said, you, pointed at her, said, you, I'm looking for somebody who can record audiobooks. Do you know anybody you think would be good at this? And she said, I think my pastor might be okay at this. And they said, here's my car. Tell me to send me a demo. And so I, I, I did a demo. I think I read um, Donald Miller's Blue Like Jazz. I think I read a chapter or something. From oh, that. yeah. On like a handheld portable Zoom recorder. And then, you know, downloaded it, put it on a CD, sent it to them. And then heard nothing for a year. And then one day I get this phone call late on a Wednesday night. And they said, hey, we want you to come in and audition for some books to record tomorrow morning. And it happened to be my day off. And I went in and I recorded, I think, auditions for three or four books. And they hired me to do all of them. And that's really how I got started doing audio books. Um, wow. It was really wow. just very serendipitous of kind of people being in the right place at the right time. Uh, and so it really started out for me as just kind of a, a side hustle, a, a nice second income for like vacation money and stuff like that. I never really had any illusions to doing it vocationally. Who could possibly make a living recording audiobooks, right? Oh, but yeah. And, and when you're not aware that the industry even exists, I mean, I, yeah. I was aware of audiobooks. I listened to audiobooks, but I had really no concept of how the sausage gets made, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, and, and oftentimes like, like you, with what you do with the, the voiceover stuff you do, you know, we hear commercials all the time. We're inundated by voiceover work all the time. But if you're not aware of the industry as an industry, then you have no concept of what this is, what the process is, how this gets done. Can you make a living at this? How do you get started? How do you, how do you transition between different things? And so I was very fortunate to be in a situation um, where I had some some great mentors at Brilliance in a very systematic environment uh, to help guide me. Now, the cool thing is that that environment kind of no longer exists. I mean, the days of going to a studio at a publisher, those days are kind of gone. And well, that was my next question. So you were going there at the beginning. At the beginning, I went yeah. there. And, and then I had another contractor contact me. They'd heard me, heard one of my books, and they said, we'd like you to record for us. Do you have a home studio? And I said, no, but if you can tell me what I need to do. And so they basically sent me a list of requirements, and I cobbled something together. And I recorded out of the closet in my master bedroom probably for the first two years I did this. Um, and, and just, you know, made it work. You know, anytime anybody was mowing their lawn, I was beating my head against the wall going, I wish they'd stop. Um, you know, the, the old man who lived across the street with the weed blower, it's like, <laughs> seriously, do you have to be out doing this? But, you know, the work got done and eventually was able to build out a studio and, and not have to worry about those kinds of things and buy better equipment and, and all of that. So, I, you know, it's, it's kind of I've been there for that transition from the studio based model to now yeah. where almost, almost exclusively the vast majority of audiobook work being done is done in, done in a home studio like like this thing right here behind me. Well, can, and I worked out of my bedroom closet, too, for 
about four years before I really, you know, expanded out and started upgrading things. Can you tell us more about, about your setup, your recording setup? Yeah, so my setup is a, is a pretty simple, I'm a, I'm a less is more kind of guy. Yeah. And so I've got a PC, so, a PC computer. Uh, I use Pro Tools as my software because I think for the audiobook industry, it's kind of the standard and it does some things that I'll be talking about in my class that are, I think, unique to Pro Tools that make it a very uh, helpful uh, tool for doing audiobooks. Uh, I've got a Neumann TLM 102 that I use as my microphone, and I've got a, uh, a Scarlett uh, interface uh, that actually got bought heat of the moment about four months ago when I was in the middle of a project and my other interface died on me in the middle of a project and I drove to the closest guitar center and said <laughs> I need an interface and with COVID and manufacturing and chip shortages this was the interface they had and it was cheap it was like 130 140 dollars I swapped it out no one's noticed a difference and it continues to get the job done. I those myself. Yeah, those are they're great workhorses. Well, they really are. And you know, there's no moving parts. It just does what it's designed to do, and it's quiet, and everybody seems to be happy with it. Yeah. Now, aside from audiobooks, uh, have you ventured out into, into into any other niches, or are you you're strictly an audiobook kind of guy? Pretty strictly audiobook, but within audiobook, I have broadened out. Um, I have a, a a producing business where I do work with a couple of companies uh, who contract with me to hire narrators and record for them. And then I have a very active audiobook proofing business uh, that my wife actually manages for me. And I have, I think, 17 proofers now. Uh, no who, kidding. Uh, wow. Contract proofing for the audiobook industry. So again, we have uh, publishers contact us and say, we have this title, we need it proofed. We send it out to proofers and we get that work done. Can you talk about producing a little bit? Uh, that's I've you know I've produced commercials and demos, but I've never uh, proofed. I mean, aside from the work that I do myself, I've I always somebody else has been on the other yeah. side of the curtain. What does that look like? Proof uh, producing is, has again also shifted in the audiobook industry in the last three to five years. It used to be a producer was kind of the 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 genius who had this vast catalog of voiceover talent. And, and, and they would, you know, read a script and they would say, you know, I think Bill DeWeese would be the perfect person for this. And then they would contact Bill DeWeese and extend you an offer and say, are you interested in this? Here's the contract and all that. That's really shifted now as companies have become much more author centric. So that now what's happening is if I get a title, uh, what they're looking for from me is they want me to put together a list of demos, uh, a reel of demos that they can send on to the author. And then the author is going to pick from among those potential voices and, and say, okay, this is the person that we want to record this book. That's so interesting. So now the authors are doing more or have more involvement in terms of choosing who they want as opposed to the publisher choosing who they want to yes. narrate? Very much so. And contracts are being written to say that when the authors, uh, when they're, when the narration rights are sold to a company to produce the audiobook, yeah. that the authors are retaining approval of the narrator that's selected. I see. Okay. Now, do you find that, that you gravitate or, uh, or are selected for, you know, any particular type of audiobook more than others, or do you just do a very wide variety of work? You know, I'm, I'm just almost exclusively now nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, within nonfiction, you know, I have some niches that I fill more frequently than others. A, a lot yeah. of faith-based, my background in pastoral ministry yeah. uh, gives me a lot of facility with like Greek Hebrew and things like that. I do a lot of business titles. I do science and technology. I do some history and things like that. And in the class, I'm going to talk about two books that I recorded that I should have never recorded. <laughs> and they consistently get reviewed terribly because I was the wrong person to record these books. I've and got so those too. I think everybody's of, got two books. They say, well, I should have never done those. Yes. I should have never done that. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it was on my Facebook page just recently, I had someone <laughs> comment and say, How in the world did you get the permission to record this book? It's terrible. And I said, You're right. Thanks. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I finally got to the point, and I have not recorded nearly done the, you know the the volume of work that you've done, but uh, and it's been a long time. But I remember remember making the mistake of going back and looking at some reviews, and then I realized, you know what, I don't need. <laughs> I don't need to be do- I was telling some students the other day, one that stuck out in my head, I remember some remember somebody saying, I don't want to hear Casey Kasem read a devotional to me. Right. And I and you know, but for some, you know, you read enough of those kind of things, you start to think, oh, well, you know, why am why am I doing this? You know, what business right. do I have? Interesting. Well, what I makes think me this is one of the things that makes audiobooks really cool is that to do audiobooks, you don't have to have a golden voice. Okay, to, talk to talk do, to us more about that. To do audiobooks, you need to be able to have an intimate conversation with someone. Mm. And if you can have an intimate conversation with someone where you're not trying to sell anything and you're not trying to convince anybody of anything, you can do audiobooks. Now, if you want to get into fiction, you got to develop some facility with character voices and accents and things right. like that. But but everybody here, here's what I think is so cool about audiobooks. And so if you love dogs, if dogs are your thing, you can find audiobooks written to people who do dogs. Mm. And if you can give that information in a conversationally intimate way, you can do audiobooks. And so it, it, it's not like it's not so much like in the in the the commercial voiceover industry where we're looking for this certain voice as much as we're looking for someone who can just sincerely convey the information that the author wants to convey. So if I hear you right, you're saying that if, if there's somebody listening who maybe has never done this before and they're, and they're saying, you know, I've never worked in broadcasting. I've never, I've never been a pastor. I've never worked behind a microphone. I've, that's not, you know, part of who I am. You're saying that with the proper teaching guidance tools and a passion that you can learn to be a communicator. Absolutely. And, and truly, Two of the best audiobook narrators I've ever worked with, uh, Amy McFadden and Kate Rudd, both came out of careers as teachers. They were mm. elementary school teachers. Yeah. And, and they were able to take that ability to tell stories and translate it into doing audiobooks. And so, um, you know, it's, it, 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 you'd be surprised by the wide variety of careers. You know, I worked with a guy who used to be a long haul truck driver who got into doing audio and his voice is okay, but he's a really good storyteller. And so, you know, again, it's not about having the golden voice. Like we often think about, you know, in a world. Right. Well, that's, and for those who are listening, I'm really glad you said that because I run into that all the time and the ability to connect often has nothing to do. Well, usually has nothing to do with how you sound. It's are you believable, and that means have you made it personal? Yeah, and it's story. That story. That is storytelling. Um, right. I so hope that uh, you know, as you watch this video, that you're saying I need to be in Tom's class because if you've ever thought about, even considered, or maybe, then you need to be in Tom's class. Uh, I'm just from knowing Tom and, and knowing his skill as a communicator and his passion, and he's just a good guy. I only like to work with good people. That's that's one of the great things about having your own business is you can kind of pick and choose. You know in that way. But I want you to be a part of this class. So there, there is a, a sign up, a link in the description. You can do that. And Tom, what a real uh, treat for me today to catch up with you. I apologize that I haven't been in touch for the past <laughs> well, 30 years. Well, I, I guess aside from once. Kind of busy. Yeah, you've been kind of busy. I've been kind of busy. Yeah. It's okay. We've found each other. And I, and I just, I applaud you for, for taking your skills and using them to build bridges that allow people to kind of peer behind the curtain and say, you know, somebody told me once that I have a nice voice or somebody told me once I'm a really good storyteller. I wonder if I could do something with that that changes my life and the lives of others that I'm communicating with. And so I applaud you for providing those types of opportunities for people in a variety of formats um, and, and trying to help people get excited about the things that you and I get to do every single day. And that's what I want. I want people to get excited about the possibilities of audiobooks and, and show how you can start small and build into something big, as well as how to look for those serendipitous moments that kind of help you trip into success, which is what most of us do. Most of us that are successful doing this, we had a good work ethic, yeah. but then we all kind of tripped into success. 
it's it's funny. What's what's that old saying? Is the harder I work, the luckier I get. Yes. You know, exactly. opportunities seem to present themselves. Well, Tom Parks, uh, again, a real pleasure. Make sure you hit that link in the description, get signed up for the class. This is going to be a special class and uh, with a special guy. So thanks again, Tom, for your time. I really look forward to it. Very excited about the class. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate the opportunity.